the making of the masterpiece was a bit of a dilemma. I, you know, a friend of mine, Rick Anwell, said just just get up there and wing it. That's what he did about a month ago, and um, that was my plan up until the last second. And uh, sort of thought, you know, I don't think I can wing it in front of 150 people for 45 minutes, even though I've been known to do that. Uh, so I just looked around for a bunch of you know smart people that I could reference and uh, put them up on screen and talk about their ideas. And um, I kind of did that, but when I was done with the whole thing, I realized that uh, I had pulled together like a universe of, of old white guys and that, you know, just did not come across as like a very diverse set of ideas or people. Um, so that realization was about 10 o'clock last night, so I just went with it. So it's, it's the presentation about what old white guys think on the topic of story. Matt's uh, the creative director and partner at Iconologic, design firm here in Atlanta. His team creates brand systems and content for uh, leading institutions like Coca-Cola, Good Magazine, the International Olympic Committee, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Volkswagen, and Atlanta's very own Andre Benjamin. Matt serves on advisory boards of Creative Circus and Good Thinking and is the founder of White Wall Films. Graduated from Roanoke College with a BA in English and as well as Portfolio Center where he studied graphic design. So a uh, round of applause for Matt. So this at Iconologic is kind of what we set out as our goal for what we do. We design profound connections between our clients and the people who matter most to them. Uh, it's kind of an ambitious goal. You know, I don't know if we hit it every time, um, but it's it's what we try to do, and it's, it's I think, a decent uh, thing to focus on. Uh, among plenty of things we could try to focus on as uh, designers and, and branding people. So I'll kind of go back to this today as I talk, but it's those kind of profound connections that I'm going to talk about today and try to justify the idea that we are actually searching for profound connections um, with the, uh, the audience that we, that we go after. And also it's important that we think about what we do in terms of people. We're not creating work that's meant to move from business to business or from uh, brand to demographic. We, we try to think in terms of from one person to another. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Everything is in regard to, to human beings. So the way we kind of go about that is through two disciplines. Uh, one is, is really systems thinking or systems design. Um, and this is really just to create things that, that can be used by lots of people effectively, that have a lot of utility, that um, can be very scalable, can be used across media, can be used across geographies, across languages. So the elements that we try to create have those, those qualities. Uh, things that can be ownable, um, that are unique to the, the institutions that we create them for. They're easy to use. Um, Things that are very cons or create consistency. Um, if it's brand guidelines, that they create very good consistency across the brand, across all that media. But at the same time, create a lot of diversity naturally. So it's a system that that generates diversity um, and, uh, and and encourages a lot of freedom in its use. So those uh, hopefully are not diametrically opposed things. A lot of consistency uh, within um, a, a free environment. Um, so that's a big part of what we do. That's 50% of it. The other part is what I'm going to kind of focus on today, and that's story. Um, you could also call it content. But what we try to do is, is have those two things work together whenever we can. It doesn't always happen. It's not always part of the job. Sometimes we get jobs that are one or the other. But we find that, that good stuff happens when that system we've created integrates with great stories. And cool stuff happens that we all want to happen, like you know, a, a living brand starts to happen. Uh, things become viral. Things become participatory. All those buzzwords that we're, that we're after these days seem to happen when content um, meets a, a really strong and diverse system. And also, you get a circle of stripes in it when you're done. All I did today was just throw together a bunch of ideas that I've run across that have to do with story that I think are 
that are just provocative. They aren't my ideas, um, but I'm just going to kind of touch on them, and I'm not uh, that you know well versed in all of these. They're just things that I find curious. So raise your hand if you know more about it than I do. But I think um, it's it's kind of worth talking about as it relates to to brand design, which is what we do. So this guy um, named Walter Fisher is a, uh, a, a theoretist, theoretician out of um, California. And he has this idea called the narrative paradigm, which is really that he's a linguist and he studies communications. And his idea is that um, storytelling is really the, the only form of communication. Everything that we do is a form of storytelling. When we communicate with each other, when we you know, speak internally to ourselves, it all happens through story. Um, and it's really that simple, and he's got lots of research behind it. Um, he says man is a storytelling animal. So I find that you know, really particularly interesting. And I just want to play this one little video and think about it in regard to this idea of narrative paradigm. I'm at the pool. I'm walking, and one of a, a bush stick poke arrows. So the bush stick poke, but you didn't tell me. Did did the blood come out? Mm -hmm. Blood came out. Wow. When I was standing on, when I was standing on the floor, when I was standing on the we're standing on the picnic chairs and I fell down on my head. On the concrete. Concrete? Yeah. The, the first thing that really struck me that was interesting was uh, a, a, a rectangle of molten steel that had been poured on the floor and then uh, one put on the wall and you're in a, about a 20-foot space and you walk out on this thing and there's this lead thing above you and there's this lead thing below you and there's a dynamic because they don't want to be floating and you know mm -hmm. it's heavy and at one point I was sort of scooting along the wall you know just trying to feel like it would be to you know, to move through it quickly, and I saw people giggling. I wanted to walk in it and through it slowly. You'll have walls tilting like this, walls tilting like that. I looked up and I'd drawn sort of the suspicion of a couple of security guards. They were handing me off to, to one another, but I wasn't thrown out. I behaved. I'm a socially responsible person. <laughs> And they, they, the elevator quit coming through Yale, so so they they trucked their grain to uh, Bagley. That there's a railroad there. They get ten cents a bushel more if they truck it. Uh, it must be about nine or ten miles. This kid's father was here. Uh, I think I'm here, Garrett's here, the one that's about six, and, and Donald, the uh, grandpa, the young kid, and his son is telling him, well, these farmers are bitching about us getting ten cents more a bushel because we're trucking our grain to Bagley. And, and my grandpa said, well, them dumb cocksuckers, he said, they ought to realize that, you know, if you're semiing it up there, you ought to get a little more money. Here's Garrett. Yeah, them dumb cocksuckers ought to know better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I about goddamn fell over. <laughs> <laughs> about the suits about this. He was about six and a half. He was about five then. <laughs> Okay, so they're all telling stories. That's just, that's what we do, but 
it has something to do with just time, I think. You know, we, we live in a world of time, and we, one thing happens, and then another thing happens. And that's how we talk about it. That's how we think about it. So what we experience turns into story, whether we know it or not. I think another way to, to uh, think about this is, is music and how we relate to that. Whenever I hear the specials, um, I immediately go to this point in time in my life in high school when I first you know, I had my first car and it was on my first date and and what happened and like I can't hear the specials and not be in that moment and that has something to do with memory for sure it's a memory trigger but also it takes me to this linear story just like that so here's another guy uh, Michael Gazzaniga I don't know how you say his name but he's a, a prominent neuroscientist and he's done all this research uh, with people whose uh, right and left brain have uh, somehow been uh, are unable to communicate uh, one to the other through traumatic injury or other reasons. And what he's found is that he did this experiment where he would say, okay, uh, move, your, move your hand up and down. And so their, I guess it's their right brain is telling him to do that. And then he would say, okay, why did you do that? So their, their left brain has no connection to what their right brain just made happen. And their left brain would come up with a story for why they did it. Well, I was, and the story didn't have any accuracy. It was just like, you know, I saw something up there and I, they just came up with this story. And this is how he explains it. I love, I love the way this neuroscientist talks. Behavior comes out and there's this little narrator up there that turns it into this story that makes us feel coherent and unified. We call this thing the interpreter. It's a very powerful force in the human condition. So there's this real thing in our brains that, that makes stories. It, it takes in all the stimuli around us. It looks at, at our own behavior and turns it into story. You know, that's a neurological thing. So I find that super, super cool. So we're hardwired for story. It's not just something we like to do. It's, it's, it's um, part of our genetics. And, you know, when I look at, just as an example, like the Occupy movement, I think that there's a really deep resonant story there for all of us. No matter what your angle or on it or experience with it is, this thing has some kind of power as a story. Not because it's consistent, but just because it, it hits some kind of button within all of us, not even the same button, but I think its power is in its story. Um, no matter whether you identify it with a moment in time, like I do the specials in my first date in high school, or whether you have some kind of broad perspective on it, whether you're against it, for it, whether you project your specific issue onto it, it's, it's got really powerful story to it. And a cool thing that this guy Jonathan Harris is doing um, you may know his work if you don't look at other stuff he's done, but this is his latest project. It's called Cowbird, and it's a, a website that really tries to get at the richness of the human experience as seen through stories in a way that like Facebook or any of the others, Twitter or, or any, uh, even, even like StoryCorps do. He's, try he's looking for richer, longer, more um, integrated stories. And what I did was just go on there. This is the home page, so you can, you can uh, search for anything. You can click on any of these topics that are pictured. Um, all these little icons at the bottom are different filters you can go through, and that's really kind of the magic of this site. You can filter it through topic, through characters that are involved, real people, through dates, through um, lots of weird ones. I don't, I don't, he doesn't have them labeled here because they're all icons, but lots of, uh, you know, through weather, through anything you can think of, you can filter these stories so it's, it's very uh, deep and broad. So all I did was search um, Occupy Wall Street and all these stories came up. So they're all from individuals and you can click on any of them and just to, this is the first one I clicked on literally to illustrate you know, the, the, the way a powerful story like that is still interpreted in different ways by all of us. This person uh, had talked all about the clowns that are, were at, at Occupy Wall Street they were so interested in it, they wound up making a movie about clowns. And they, they have a whole write-up about that. And as you go deeper into it, you can see that on the, on the right there, uh, you can see the people that are involved, 
um, other stories from the same author, um, other stories um, with her in them, where she's a character. Uh, so you can see, and, and more and more, there you know, um, other stories from that date. So you can see how this can just continue to grow and grow, and I hope it does, but you, you get a sense of the richness of story. Okay, here's another guy. <laughs> when I finish this, I realize these are all like old white guys. It's not, it's not intentional. I, I should have called this like, you know, old white guys and what they think about story. But um, that's kind of how it turned out. So I guess it's sort of a Western point of view, male, old white guy point of view. But um, this guy is Joseph Campbell. I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, and he's, uh, the amount of knowledge within this guy is crazy. Um, I don't know how he got it all in one lifetime, but he, he uh, visited and studied cultures all around the world and was really interested among other things in myth and and he just kind of learned all the myths and all the ancient stories and came to a conclusion that they all essentially were the same story um, and that that is because they all sort of generated from the same spot and over time they broke up and were deconstructed and took on their own personalities and their own cultural meanings and turned into all the thousands of ancient stories there are now but he called it the monomyth and did a lot of work to kind of summarize uh, what that was. And, and this is a chart that, is, that kind of does that. And I think he called it the hero's journey. So it's all about the hero moving through this adventure. Um, and, and he moves from moving counterclockwise there, starting at the top, like this call to adventure. And then, of course, runs into crisis or some kind of test. And I love all these. The, the brother battle, the dragon battle, dismemberment, crucifixion, abduction, night sea journey, wonder journey, the whale's belly. So some of those, you know, you know where they're coming from. Um, and then uh, he or she um, moves through uh, time and eventually comes to some kind of transformation, um, which is in all stories really, like sacred marriage, father atonement, apotheosis, and then comes out of it and has some kind of either resurrection or realization um, or rescue. And then it keeps going, like you know, like the Odyssey. You know, just the, the cycle of adventure keeps going. So whether it's the Odyssey or or the Quran or the Bible or or um, you know the latest Hollywood movie, those ancient stories are there, and we all feel them. So we're I think that's how we're all deeply connected with that common knowledge. So we all have this different perspective, like I was talking about with Occupy Wall Street, but we also have this common understanding of, of the story or the different stories from our, from our society. And this is a good example of resonance. You know, this, my kids love Star Wars. I love Star Wars. I bet if it was created 200 years ago, people would have loved Star Wars a lot because um, they, they wouldn't have understood what it was. But, but it's not just all the lightsabers and, the, and you know, the Wookiees and all that that make it resonant. It's, it's that ancient story. And, and you may know that George Lucas was a huge fan of Joseph Campbell. And um, they actually met each other after Star Wars and did some, some uh, talks together. Um, so you can look those up. But, but that, that ancient story, is that monomyth, is definitely embedded in Star Wars. And it's fun to look at you know, all the Hollywood stuff that comes out and kind of ask, what is the story in there? I took a class once where the, the uh, beginning of it, the professor said, there are only two stories in the world. There's, there's tragedy and there's grace. And then he made us for the rest of the semester go through movies and, and figure out which one it was. And it's, it's fun to do. Even if you're watching like a, you know, a, a Mexican novella or something, and, and uh, not novella, what are those called? Right. Um, it's in there too. So then Carl Jung is a guy that, you know, I, I don't know that much about, but he's another brilliant old white guy that, uh, that had lots of ideas, and, and one of which was the idea of archetypes. And uh, it's, it ties in with all of this. This is a super simplified chart of, of some of his ideas. The circle is, is the soul. The little point in the middle is the self. Uh, the line across is, is consciousness. And above it is ego, or, or the I. Um, and below it is what he called the shadows. Um, later, Freud would call that the subconscious. And in those shadows are these persona that we all um, understand. 
And they're not from learning, but they're from, the way I think about it, they're really in our DNA. Like, the, you know, through time, our DNA is taking on, taking on these archetypes and we recognize them immediately. They're models in our world that we identify with and um, he called them mask. We put them on. Um, and, and I'm sure you've heard personas referred to in the world of branding as well, but this is the origin of it. Um, this is a list, I don't think this is his exact list, but it's kind of a, one of the many that came out of that thinking. And you know, as we do our work, we look at this list a lot of times. Coke is one of my clients. They work with these ideas very closely and they're very specific about the persona that they're going, uh, that they're working with for any given brand or any given project. So I think what, you know, uh, in regard to what I do, we think of it as, as people become the protagonist of the story that you're trying to, to perpetuate or propel. Don't think of it as like, I'm gonna tell you a story, but isn't it better if we get people involved in a story in which they become the protagonist? So just some examples to think about archetypes. This is um, Burning Man, you know, who's, who are the archetypes that that go there, are those the warriors, the creators? Um, the church revival, are those the innocents? Are they the, the nurturers? Uh, the TED conference, you know, what kind of people go there? They aren't all the same, but it's fun to think of it in regard to, to archetypes. So keeping that in mind, jumping, jump to the other side of which is pure individuality. So I don't think of it as like um, target audience, but we do try to think about these archetypes that are deep within each of us. But all of us are all very different. And one way of looking at that is this guy, Howard Gardner, has this idea of multiple intelligences. And if any of you are involved in education, you're familiar with this idea. Or he says there are a variety of intelligences. So there's not one kind. There's, um, uh, there's not an IQ that is sort of generic. It's based on, on, on who we are and, and how we relate to the world. And he breaks it down into all these different types, uh, body, kinesthetic, um, you know, naturalistic, musical, etc. cetera. Um, so each of us are kind of tuned for different stories. We don't all receive every story in the same way. Uh, this is a picture of my son um, at the Waldorf School that he attends, he's in first grade. This is years later from that uh, story he told at the kitchen table. And it's his birthday, this is last week, and it's interesting, in, in his first grade, grade class, you can tell that the teacher understands multiple intelligences. She's, um, they do things like teach math through music. Uh, they, they stand and throw a ball to each other while they, they talk about math. Um, she's got all the intelligence, intelligences happening, happening at one time. Um, and as I said, if you're a teacher, you understand this a lot more than I do. But um, it's fun to see that at play and to think about it in regard to, to brand design. Then another couple of people, and now we have an old white woman, actually, Gertrude Stein, <clears throat> along with Pablo Picasso, and, and they were both involved in this idea of cubism. Uh, and it's always been interesting to me that you know, just the theory behind it, but briefly, I guess it's that you look at any given thing from lots of different angles and lots of different perspectives, um, not all of which are physical, but emotional and spiritual and what have you, and you create a broader context of that thing, so it's, it leads to a different understanding. So the way I look at it is it, it means that we build story from different points of view. Keyword build. That inside of us, we, we take in all this information, all this stimuli, we start to build a story from it. And, and that's what I think, that's the process I think they went through in building these images or these cubist stories. So um, just to illustrate that, I briefly want to show a project um, that I'm just going to kind of blow through, but it's a magazine that we uh, do for an architecture firm. Um, and this particular one was on the topic of, of energy, um, which is a a big topic and actually our idea um, in presenting it was that energy is sort of at the crux of our whole existence and that it it's, you know, infiltrates everything that we do and it's, it's really important. But it's a lot to, to bite off. I mean, to do a magazine on a topic that big is, is pretty daunting. So the way we went about it was to um, look at it from uh, sort of two different um, perspectives. One is time and one is 
is place. Um, those two things come together to create here, which is the name of the magazine. Um, and then the theme around all that was energy. I'm going to go fast through all this. Um, we, we took different uh, points of view, micro, macro, anecdotal, summative, intuitive, and rational. So, you know, appealing to those multiple intelligences. This is the cover. It, the, we tried to have a kind of symmetry to the magazine. This uh, is sort of a tease into some of the content that will follow. So I'm just going to go through a bunch of spreads and mostly just note the, uh, the point of view we were taking. So we looked at chronology, like what happened, when did it happen. It, it all, everything that we covered took place over the course of a year. So the uh, inside front cover on the left there was one of the first events of the year, this pipeline explosion in uh, Nigeria. And then on the inside back cover is December 31st, um, in Madison Square Garden with this new energy efficient ball that uh, dropped. And then these as milestones through the, the magazine we looked at events that happened over the course of the year. So I won't get into them but it was all um, time and place specific. Then we looked at data around the idea of energy. What do the numbers tell us? What are the facts? All the processes. <clears throat> then we used analogy. Um, so we looked at things like uh, different countries and uh, how they're dealing with energy. China versus uh, the U.S. is a very interesting comparison. Um, and we also looked at um, analogy for things that have happened in the past. <laughs> like like uh, this is a quote from Woodrow Wilson about uh, World War I. Then we took a personal point of view, like who, what individuals are affected and how. So we did these little vignettes about uh, different folks that uh, either, uh, well, I won't get into it, it'll take too long, but either you know, they, they don't have the energy they need uh, or they're living off the grid, et cetera. So these were just little bio sketches. We also followed one person through their day and, and looked at all the energy that they expended um, or gained through intake. Um, so that's noted in all these little charts here. Then dialogue, you know, interchange between people. We gathered a bunch of experts on the topic and just had them talk about it and we documented all that. Then we took a historical point of view. We looked at some of the great minds and uh, the, the ideas they've had, the inventions they've had, some of which failed and some of which succeeded. Da Vinci, Edison, who, Zillard, I can't pronounce his name, nuclear power. Then we looked into the future and we, uh, we took this idea of um, what are big companies saying about their commitments into the future. Uh, five years from now, ten years from now, what will the world be like according to their corporate uh, initiatives? And we also had um, politicians in here. <clears throat> Then we just documented stuff. We got photographers to uh, look at the effects of all this on our environment. These are shots by Greg Miller. He went up to Lake Lanier when the water was very low and uh, took pictures of all the detritus that was on the shoreline. And then lastly, we just looked at inventions this is an idea called sky farming. So um, basically we just looked at it from a lot, a lot of points of view. A little bit out of um, self-protection because we didn't know how to handle this topic in like a comprehensive way. So we just took little pieces of it. But also with, in, in a kind of deeper way, the idea that people will connect it all, they'll connect the dots and create their own story, their own opinion, their own point of view. We try not to editorialize it all. We just created the components of story and let people plug it in as they move through this. <clears throat> so just some thoughts coming out of that. Stories don't have to be linear. They don't have to have words. They don't have to be complete, as I just described. They don't even have to be consistent. They don't have to be accurate. That's back to that idea about um, that uh, the guy who studied two sides of the, the brain, that he found that people were less concerned about, their brains were less concerned about accuracy of what has happened 
than they were about coherence. So it was, it's like a comfort thing. They just want to um, take in all the stimulus and turn it into a coherent story. Then it's not so much about the accuracy of it, just that it's whole, so that you feel whole inside. <clears throat> they don't have to be told all at once. That's a huge one for what we do because we no longer have the opportunity to say, okay, sit down, I'm gonna tell you a story. It's, it's every day in all kinds of media, all at once, broken up into a thousand pieces. Hopefully you're still maintaining some kind of story. Not so much control, but just an arc of a story that the people that you're communicating with hopefully take part in and become the protagonist. And you don't even have to tell the story. Tell is maybe you know, an old fashioned or a less than complete way of talking about story. But I do think they have to be interesting. This is something that's sometimes left behind in, in meetings with clients is just, is it interesting, you know? Um, and I think that's a good kind of criteria for all stories. So some things to keep in mind, this is all just basic stuff, but as, as you're working with the idea of story, asking questions about, you know, these are obvious things, 101, but who are the characters, what's the setting, the plot, the theme, I left off an E. Um, you could ask who's them too. Uh, the arc of the story, conflict is a big one um, that we think about because conflict and drama is not always something that our clients want in a story, but it's naturally there. Any interesting story has obstacles and conflict in it, so don't try to avoid it. Look for it. Um, and then what's the climax or the, 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 um, the end or the, the um, transformation that takes place? Then there are all kinds of story, stories there. Um, back to that idea of, you know, they're, they're, those are deep-seated in our, in our society. And then you know, just a list there of all the different um, specific little story types that can be told. So I think maybe this is sort of a summative question with this presentation is, can we tell stories that, that you know, as we're doing this thing called branding, that um, I shouldn't keep saying we because I don't know if everybody does that. That's what I do. But, uh, you know, can we tell stories that are genuine, that aren't contrived, and that have some kind of value to the people that are, that are either taking them in or participating with them. And I just like this quote. I don't know why I put it in there. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our clients, but not a whole lot. Coca-Cola is one of them. And um, when I think about story and Coca-Cola, it's uh, you know, their, their sort of, their vision of what their brand is about is happiness. And that is a specific part of our lives, happiness. Um, tragedy is not a big part of happiness, you know, so it doesn't fit into every story type. It's, it's a moment in our life, um, and uh, that's that. But let me, let me talk about how we sort of take that big idea that, it, that runs through their whole brand and apply it to, to projects. This is one that we did. They came to us with uh, this cool idea of we're going to find three kids and um, send them around the world over the course of the year to every country, literally, and uh, send them on a search for happiness. And what was cool about it is that they weren't going to put a lot of constrictions around the whole thing. They didn't have a team. They didn't have handlers going with them. They hopefully had, you know, what they needed as far as paperwork, but that was about it. They, they had, you know, sort of a per diem and they had lots of cameras and equipment to, uh, to uh, upload all the stories and, and experiences that they ran into. But they were just on this sort of vague you know, trip to go find happiness. Um, one of the ideas for moving through every country was that they would touch every market and that um, each of those markets would be able to use this as kind of a, a PR event. You know, here they come and let's, let's uh, invite them in. But what they ask us to do is a couple things. One, the system for the whole event. So what does it look like? What are the components that each market can use so that this you know, ties together um, visually and, and functionally? Um, and you know, all, the, all the media involved, websites and Twitter and um, you know, every, everything from, from tip to stern. So we did the, the system, but also they asked us to look at the components of the story that would create a thread that people could understand. There were, certainly when they arrive in, in you know, Botswana, there was going to be an experience there 
for everyone in Botswana that would be sort of encapsulated, but also we wanted people in Botswana to understand the, the whole story arc. So we had lots of ideas around that. I just wanted to mention one, which was this idea of a, um, like a, a bottle exchange or a happiness exchange. So we started with a bottle that we created. Um, and the idea was that these three people would take a bottle that came from one country that was created by an artist and was super cool looking, and they would pass it to the next country. And that country would take that bottle, keep it, and then create their own body bottle and pass it to another country. And the, uh, the messengers were these three kids. So simple idea, but it created this narrative that everybody identified with to our delight, and it became a pretty big um, part of the whole program. And it became kind of like a moment that um, they built some, some ritual around when they arrived in these countries. So it was kind of like, here's why we're here. This is, this is what we're doing, as opposed to just landing and saying, where's happiness? You know, they, they had something to do. So we built sort of a component of the story. And then all those bottles, which look super cool, were you know, uploaded on a, a daily or weekly basis. And when you went to the website, you could see all these bottles. And then they were collected at the end, and they're all in the, the, um, the Coke Museum, the world of Coke, I should say. Um, so that was pretty cool. That was very much about story. And it, what was great about it is it was over a specific amount of time. So cut to another one of our clients, um, the International Olympic Committee, which is a little bit different. Um, we've done a lot of work with them. Iconologic's been involved with them for 25 years, before my time at Iconologic. Um, and we have all different kinds of clients within the Olympic movement, one of which is the International Olympic Committee, but we also work for cities that are hosting the games or, or cities that are bidding for the games and sponsors that, um, that are partners in the games. <clears throat> Uh, so what's the story here? You know, it started obviously with the Greeks, but then this guy de Coubertin uh, created the modern games, and it's just so cool the kind of things he came up with all at once. One of which was a sketch of these, you know, five rings, and there they are, 1914. But he started to build rituals that we just take for granted now. Not all of which came from the, the Greeks. Um, you know, the parade of nations the four-year segments, which are now two years between winter and summer games. Just incredible story that continues to build on itself and also has this ancient um, background. So like that feels a little bit to me like the ancient origins of, of story um, in general that we've talked about. So we're doing a bunch of stuff for them, one of which is, is creating the, the brand standards for the Olympic rings. We just redrew the rings. This is a year-long project, not just the rings, but all the standards. Um, and the main idea was to go back to his original rings and, and refine those. That's what you see here. Um, so that's kind of, oh, we also have done the typeface um, that will hopefully be around for 100 years for the International Olympic Committee and all the thousands of templates that they'll use. <clears throat> but then jumping over to like a moment in time within Olympism um, when the games are taking place, in contrast to all that consistency you want to create with the story, you want that moment in time to be very specific. And believe me, the people that hold the games want it to be very specific and all about um, you know, the place it's held and the culture um, that's hosting it, while it's also about the Olympics in general. So we've been able to do that from Atlanta all the way through um, Rio, the upcoming games. Um, in some shape or form, we've been involved. With the Torino Winter Games, we got to do the entire look of the games. So um, uh, what I found interesting about it is really uh, thinking about the audience and who was a part of it. Um, and the way we looked at it is that we sort of scoped out from the athlete. The things we're creating were, were firstly for the athletes that are in the, you know, uh, on the slopes and are surrounded by the visuals we create, the visual story, but then scoping out the spectators and then the, the, the um, community at large there. Um, in the case of Italy, you know, the province of Italy, which has a very, you know, identifies with itself very much. And then the larger, the, the country of Italy um, has, you know, a huge stake in the, in the games. And then the world. Uh, and so it kind of blows your mind trying to deal with like an athlete all the way up to the world and deal with the idea of um, specific um, things that talk to those Italians but also have universal meaning. So it was great fun. It was also fun to work with Italians because they, 
they get design. So these are just kind of a few things that we say to our clients that, that kind of express everything I'm talking about. One is just like, don't be afraid to, to take some risk because you have to. Like when I talked about conflict or drama within what you do. Well, it seems like if your, your idea for your brand is happiness, where's the drama there? But it turned out there was some drama in that Expedition 206 because believe me, every time they tried to go from one country to the next, something was happening. Somebody was puking or somebody was stuck in, a, you know, in customs or, or, or there was nobody waiting for them or, or what have you. Somebody got sick, you know, just went on and on. So there was a lot of drama and it made it compelling while it was still all about looking for happiness. Um, this is a big one that I think I'm just starting to learn more and more, which is trust in beauty. <clears throat> Doing things that are just beautiful are, are, are pretty profound when we think about um, our reaction to that comes from this deep well, those shadows that I talked about. And it really does have meaning. It really does, um, uh, I used to kind of scoff a little bit at like color theory and the meanings behind colors even though I knew there was something there, maybe it's just because I couldn't really uh, touch it. But like with those Italian games, it took us a long time to kind of zero in on, on the color, a long time, <laughs> like, you know, years. And it wasn't until the games took place that I realized what a big decision it was, that red, and the particular red we chose, while there were tons, really all the colors in what we did, red was kind of the, the thing that came out of the games. It had huge emotional impacts that I didn't really understand, not just sort of, Red means this to me, but it, that it was sort of deep within the shadows of everybody that was a part of the games. <clears throat> then be human. I've talked a lot about this. Just remember that you're talking to individuals um, or you're, you're working with individuals. You're trying to connect with individuals, not, not stereotypes or, or target audiences. Uh, open up. Just, just open your brand up and let other people take part of it, take part in it. This is uh, a project we did for the Beijing Games where we um, picked eight artists uh, around China to um, do their own Coke bottles. And then they collaborated with musicians to create a, a song that connected to that same theme. So, you know, Coke allowed itself to, allowed other people to express its brand. Create drama, I've already talked about this. <clears throat> Presume intelligence, like I hate this idea of lowest common denominator. If you really respect that idea that we all have different intelligences and we're all sort of geniuses in that respect, um, then you should never talk down to anybody. It's more just a matter of like, what is this person's uh, intelligence and how are they gonna receive the story and how can I, like with that architecture magazine, how can I touch them? They may not, get, they may not go after the data, but they may go after the personal story. Uh, take a stand. Just remember that you're communicating ideas as well as um, color and all those ever other things. Really stand behind an idea. And then we always remind ourselves to sell the truth. Um, people can tell the difference between truth and bullshit super fast. Then just finally, I, I ran into this. Uh, this woman spoke at TEDx here in Atlanta. And I was watching the video as I was kind of putting this together. And um, she has this group called the Center for Narrative Medicine. And it just really kind of reminded me of everything I was trying to dig at here with the, with the idea of story. Her belief, as she puts it, is uh, stories can be the connector between doctor and patient. So in the medical field, you've got this broken healthcare system. You've got doctors that have a thousand things to worry about, one of which is to just like keep up with the pace of, of um, innovation and study within the medical field, understand you know, everything that's taking place, understand all the biological systems, um, but she's saying, despite all that, what is really going to create uh, more fitting and better care is the understanding of, of the patient's story. And I think her point is it's not just, okay, tell me what's wrong. It's understanding as they talk, what let the doctor connecting all those dots and understanding the arc of their story, um, not just the thing that, that is, is not just the disease, but how it relates to every other part of their, their life. So that seems to kind of validate what, you know, the way I think about story within brand design, that in the medical field, they're really looking at it closely as well. The end. Um, so that's my talk. I want to do some Q&A if we have time. 
Uh, the question was, what's the first step when we try to put that story together for a client? Uh, I mean, a creative brief, you know, the same thing that most people do, but <clears throat> I think uh, I've heard it called the irreducible meaning um, that, you're, that you're looking for. That's the theme, this is the irreduci irreducible meaning of the story. So we try to tighten it up as much as we can into a sentence that tells the story. And that's only for our own use, but we kind of put that on the wall and make sure that all the other stuff that swirls around the project keeps tying back to that. And when you're on big projects that take place over a lot of time, a lot of media, it can be easy to lose that, that core. So that's the first step, I guess. Um, and then we just sort of run around in circles a lot. Uh, do, do clients ever have a different <laughs> point of view on what their story well, is I, I than we do? Right, right. I think it's harder if, um, <clears throat> well, if you, if you start with the client and they say, our brand, our story is this, you know, in total, and you disagree, that's, kind of, that's pretty hard. Like if I go to Coke and say, I don't think you're about happiness. Um, but as that overall brand breaks down into, you know, let's, let's talk to this group, um, and we think this is what we should be saying, we think this is what they're interested in. That's when I think there's a lot of room for negotiation. You know, we've talked to a lot of those people, and actually that's not the way they perceive you and how you fit into their lives. Let, we spend a lot of time talking about those people. You know, what are they dealing with outside of your brand? Um, and sometimes, maybe not with sophisticated brands, but some of our clients are kind of, it's a little bit of a splash of cold water that like, people don't care or think that much about their brand. And that's, I, I find myself saying that sometimes to, to smaller brands. That, like, people aren't walking around thinking about you. So you've got to figure out how you can just, if you're lucky, fit into like, their day. Uh, we're lucky to have a lot of long-term clients, um, which is great you know, in regard to, to your question that uh, there's a common understanding about what you're, you're going after. But like with the Olympic world, the, the people we work with are different every time we sit down because there's so many different projects. But it's nice when you sit down with those groups and there is common understanding about the basic story. And then you can get into, you know, how do you tell it in this particular case. But um, so we're not always talking about, you know, what is the big story? It's just like, what's the little, what's the plot line here? And we don't always use those terms. That's just for this presentation. The, the question is, if, we, if a client hires us just for a short amount of time for a specific project um, and we have ideas about this big long-term story, is that problematic? And I, I think the answer is no because hopefully, I mean, we just talk about if they hired us for, you know, a, a video, say, then we're trying to tell the right story in that video, but that story should be, you know, somewhat timeless or, you know, expansive enough to extend beyond, you know, into a relationship where three years, three years later, they're saying, you know, that story that you identified, you know, holds true. So we start small. We don't get, you know, too ambitious about it. But we do try to ask those questions about universality and what's the deep story and all that stuff. And sometimes clients just, you know, are like, what? Where's the video? <laughs> so you got to be careful with it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>